The Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams. Chapter 25. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has this to say about the planet of Golga Frenchen. It is a planet with an ancient and mysterious history, rich in legend, red and occasionally green, with the blood of those who sought in times gone by to conquer her. A land of parched and barren landscapes, of sweet and sultry air, heady with the scent of the perfume springs that trickle over its hot and dusty rocks to nourish the dark and musty lichens beneath. A land of fevered brows and intoxicated imaginings, particularly among those who taste the lichens. A land also of cool and shaded thoughts, amongst those who have learned to forswear the lichens and find a tree to sit beneath. A land also of steel and blood and heroism, a land of the body and of the spirit. This was its history. And in all this ancient and mysterious history, the most mysterious figures of all were without doubt those of the great circling poets of Arium. These circling poets used to live in a remote mountain passes where they would lie in wait for small bands of unwary travellers, circle round them and throw rocks at them. And when the travellers cried out, saying, why didn't they go away and get on with writing some poems instead of pestering people with all this rock-throwing business, they would suddenly stop and then break into one of the 794 great song cycles of Vasilian. These songs were all of extraordinary beauty and even more extraordinary length, and all fell into exactly the same pattern. The first part of each song would tell how there once went forth from the city of Vasilian a party of five sage princes and four horses. The princes, who are of course brave, noble and wise, travelled widely in distant lands, fight giant ogres, pursue exotic philosophies, take tea with weird gods and rescue beautiful monsters from ravening princesses before finally announcing they have achieved enlightenment and that their wanderings are therefore accomplished. The second and much longer part of each song would then tell of all their bickerings about which of them is going to have to walk back. All this lay in the planet's remote past. It was, however, a descendant of one of these eccentric poets who invented the spurious tales of impending doom which enabled the people of Golga Frenchen to rid themselves of an entire useless third of their population. The other two-thirds stay firmly at home and live full, rich and happy lives until they were all suddenly wiped out by a virulent disease contracted from a dirty telephone. The Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams. Chapter 26. That night, the ship crash-landed on an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet which circled a small, unregarded yellow sun in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy. In the hours preceding the crash, Ford Prefect had fought furiously but in vain to unlock the controls of the ship from their preordained flight path. It had quickly become apparent to him that the ship had been programmed to convey its payload safely, if uncomfortably, to its new home, but to cripple itself beyond all hope of repairing the process. Its screaming blazing descent through the atmosphere had stripped away most of its superstructure and outer shielding, and its final inglorious belly flop into a murky swamp had left its crew only a few hours of darkness during which to revive and offload its deep frozen and unwanted cargo. The ship began to settle almost at once, slowly upending its gigantic bulk in the stagnant slime. Once or twice during the night it was starkly silhouetted against the sky as burning meteors, the detritus of its descent, flashed across the sky. In the grey pre-dawn light it let out an obscene, roaring gurgle and sank forever into the stinking depths. When the sun came up that morning, it shed its thin, watery light over a vast area, heaving with wailing hairdressers, public relations executives, opinion pollsters and the rest, all clawing their way desperately to dry land. A less strong-minded sun would probably have gone straight back down again, but it continued to climb its way through the sky, and after a while the influence of its warming rays began to have some restoring effect on the feebly struggling creatures. Countless numbers had, unsurprisingly, been lost to the swamp in the night, and millions more had been sucked down with the ship, but those that survived still numbered hundreds of thousands, and as the day wore on, they crawled all over the surrounding countryside, each looking for a few square feet of solid ground on which to collapse and recover from their nightmare ordeal. Two figures moved further afield. From a nearby hillside, Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent watched the horror of which they could not feel a part. Filthy, dirty trick to pull, muttered Arthur. Ford scraped a stick along the ground and shrugged. 
and an imaginative solution to a problem. I'd have thought, he said. Why can't people just learn to live together in peace and harmony, said Arthur. Ford gave a loud, very hollow laugh. <laughs> Forty-two, he said with a malicious grin. No, doesn't work. <laughs> Never mind. Arthur looked at him as if he'd gone mad, and seeing nothing to indicate the contrary, realised that it would be perfectly reasonable to assume that this had in fact happened. What do you think will happen to them all? he said after a while. In an infinite universe, anything can happen, said Ford. Even survival. Strange but true. A curious look came into his eyes as they passed over the landscape and settled again on the scene of misery below them. I think they'll manage for a while, he said. Arthur looked up sharply. Why do you say that? he said. Ford shrugged. Just a hunch, he said, and refused to be drawn on any further questions. Look, he said suddenly. Arthur followed his pointing finger. Down amongst the sprawling masses, a figure was moving, or perhaps lurching would be a more accurate description. He appeared to be carrying something on his shoulder. As he lurched from prostrate form to prostrate form, he seemed to wave whatever the something was at them in a drunken fashion. After a while, he gave it a struggle and collapsed in a heap. Arthur had no idea that this was meant to mean to him. Movie camera, said Ford, recording the, the historic moment. Well, I don't know about you, said Ford again after a moment, but I'm off. He sat a while in silence. After a while, this seemed to require comment. Uh, when you say you're off, what do you mean exactly, said Arthur. Good question, said Ford, getting total silence. Looking over his shoulder, Arthur saw that he was twiddling with knobs on a small black box. Ford had already introduced this box to Arthur as a sub ether sensomatic, but Arthur had merely nodded absently and not pursued the matter. In his mind, the universe still divided into two parts, the Earth and everything else. The Earth, having been demolished to make way for a hyperspace bypass, meant that this view of things was a little lopsided, but Arthur tended to cling to that lopsidedness as being his last remaining contact with his horn. Sub-ether sensomatics belonged firmly in the everything else category. Not a sausage, said Ford, shaking the thing. Sausage, thought Arthur to himself, as he gazed listlessly at the primitive world about him. What I wouldn't give for a good earth sausage. Would you believe, said Ford in exasperation, that there are no transmissions of any kind within light years of this benighted tip? Are you listening to me? What? said Arthur. We're in trouble, said Ford. Oh, said Arthur. This sounded like month old news to him. Until we pick up anything on this machine, said Ford, our chances of getting off this planet are zero. It may be some freak standing wave effect in the planet's magnetic field, in which case we just travel round and round until we find a clear reception area. Coming? He picked up his gear and strawed off. Arthur looked down the hill. The man with the movie camera had struggled back up to his feet just in time to film one of his colleagues collapsing. Arthur picked up a blade of grass and strode on after Ford.